anybody seen it, but last Sunday morning in, in uh, literally Nashville, Tennessee, there was a person walked into a church and shot up the church. Killed one lady and wounded, I think it was five or six others, and one of them was the pastor of the church. Um, just keep that in mind this week. we be praying for that church. Um, you know, God tells us that Jesus said, you know, you will be persecuted for my name's sake. Now, I pray and hope that never happens here in Red Level, but, you know, we are standing up for Jesus Christ. And, you know, persecution, whether it's somebody just called you a Bible thumper like I talked about this morning or, or whether it's them shooting you, um, you know, that's the evil satanic world that we live in today. Um, and, you know, this isn't the first time that's happened. It's happened throughout history. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I come to you this evening, Lord. Just thank you for the opportunity you've given us to come out here tonight and fellowship together as a body of believers, Lord, and to give testimonies of the things that you're doing in our lives. And, Lord, to sing praise and worship to you, Father, we do thank you that we can go to that quiet place, whether it's in the garden or in a closet in our home or out on the boat, wherever it may be, Lord, and we can spend time one on one with you, and you do speak to us, and you do spend time with us, and Lord, we thank you that you are a personal God, that you desire to have that personal relationship with us. Father, I do lift up to you this church that uh, was shot up and had this tragedy last weekend, Lord, I pray that you would be with those people, Father, uh, be with that whole church and in that community. I lift up to you tonight, uh, Skyler and Talisha's uncle, Patrick, Lord. I pray, Father, as he goes for surgery this Tuesday, Lord, to um, have this brain tumor removed. Lord, we just ask now that you would just guide the doctor's hands, the surgeon's hands, Lord, that they would not make any mistakes. Father, when they're working on the brain, just a little slip can mean a, mean a lot. And, Father, we just pray that they would be able to remove it all at this time and and that, uh, that everything will work out for him, Lord. And that you just take care of him and his family. <clears throat> Lord, bring comfort and peace to those that are around him. And Father, I just pray now that you allow your Holy Spirit to speak through me tonight, Father. As we look at the things that you've talked and told to Jeremiah. Lord, I just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> tonight I'm going to be looking at God's illustration to Jeremiah. We're going to be looking in Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah 18, uh, you know, as I said this morning, me and dad will never get on the page on like what I'm going to be preaching on. And, you know, he's talking about God still speaks to us and he does speak to us in many, many ways. And he reveals himself to us in different ways through nature. The Bible talks about how he reveals himself to us in multiple ways. Sometimes it's through reading his word. Sometimes it's through other people speaking life into us, encouraging us. Um, sometimes it's, it's through visual things, things that we see. Um, you know, and I, God speaks to us differently, you know, individually differently. Because things that work for me may not work for you. I'm a very hands-on visual person. You know, I, I, I'm pretty good at, if I see something done, I'm pretty good at picking it up and doing it again. Uh, but I can read it and have all the instructions, you know, word for word. And, and it's like, I don't know where I'm going, you know, type of thing. But when I can see it, it, it's, it catches on a lot quicker for me. So God recognizes that in our lives. Being he's a personal God, he knows what we personally need in our life and how to personally reach us. So for some of us, it is speaking right through God's word. And others, it's speaking to us through other people. And, and sometimes it's visual things and sometimes it's each individual gets all three of them at one time sometimes because we're more heavy and God has to use all all these multiple different ways to, to get it into our head and this evening we're going to look in the book of Jeremiah uh, about this message, this illustration that God gave Jeremiah now Jeremiah was a prophet of God unto the nation of Israel and he was called the weeping prophet because he was tasked with delivering some very tough messages to the people. And because of the messages he had to deliver to the people, he was not liked by many people. Um, they were very, 
you know, tough messages. You got to realize a lot of the prophets, they brought messages to this the nation of Israel, to the people of Israel, and they were warning them. Hey, what you're doing is wrong, and if you don't change, God's fixing to bring his judgment, his wrath upon you. So either do what he says to do or, or suffer. And so, you know, a lot of times the prophets weren't liked, but they were relaying the message that God had given them. The message was for the nation of Israel, but there is a message in it for us today. We're going to look at God's illustration to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6 here. It says there in Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again in, into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the hands of the potter, so are you in, the, in my hands, O house of Israel. God tells Jeremiah here to go down to the potter's house. Go down there, and, and, and I'm going to give you a message there. And, and this message, again, was for Israel, but we, there's something in that for us today. M.R. Dehaney said all scripture has a primary inter interpretation. In other words, there's a primary interpretation, and that would have been for the Israelites at that time. But all scripture has a personal application, and that is the case with this passage. There is a primary interpretation, and people always, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, that scripture was written for the Israelites. Almost like they're saying that, oh, that was written for the Israelites that don't have nothing to do with us today. My Bible tells me that all scripture is inspired by God. Amen. And reprovable for all men. Amen. He doesn't say, it's, well, you know, the Old Testament was mainly written for the Israelites, so, you know, just forget about that. He says all scripture is inspired by God. It was given to these people to write by God. And it's for you to correct and, and teach and, and give to people so that they can learn in their time. The primary interpretation is that Israel had turned away from God and had allowed them to be, and God had allowed them to be broken in an attempt to bring them back to him. God allowed Jeremiah to see the potter at work at the wheel to show him what he would do with Israel. The application is each of us sees ourselves as this clay on the wheel, being molded into a vessel. For the potter's sake. I want to look at three different things tonight. I want to look firstly at the clay. But Jeremiah gets to the potter's house. And he walks in the house. And here's a lump of clay. And I don't know if y'all know anything about pottery. And how these potters make clay. I, I really don't know a whole lot about it. But you know they got a little wheel that spins. They take a, a lump of clay. And they plop it down on there. And they get it just the right wetness. And, and they spin that wheel. And get it spinning, and they start making stuff out of it. It's amazing. But that's what this guy was doing. He was, he was forming, he was working the clay into a vessel. But something happened to it. You know, as he's going along, as he's working this clay, he comes to a hard spot in the clay, a spot that maybe didn't get mixed up right. He didn't get enough moisture into that spot. So he's got this hard spot in the clay. And the vessel gets ruined. He, he keeps applying pressure to that hard spot. And he keeps working it. He keeps dipping his hand in water to try to get that hard spot worked out of it. But it, it just, the mold breaks. The vessel breaks. And then the potter doesn't say, oh, you know, let me just throw that lump of clay away and I'll go get another lump of clay and start again. No, he takes and he gets it and he kneads it and works it and rolls it and pounds it and does all this stuff and then he he slaps that thing back down on his wheel again, and he starts going again. The question is, in the illustration, what does the clay represent? What does the clay represent? We see this answer back almost at the very beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. God took the dust of the ground. Now, if you do research, clay is the most moldable dirt 
soil substance on earth. So we can imagine, speculate, whatever we want to call it here, that God gathered up some clay and he started forming Adam out of this clay, out of the dust of the earth is what he says there. So in the illustration, Israel, Israel would have been the clay. But for our application today, we need to see that we are the clay. That God is molding us and making us into the vessel that he would have us to be. Romans, or Job 10, 9 says, Remember, I pray, that you have made me like clay, and will you turn me into dust again? Job's telling here, you know, Job went through some very deep, dark trials. He says, God, you, you've took the clay that is I am, and you've molded me. Are you going to allow me to break back down and turn back to dust? In other words, are you going to allow me to die? He didn't. He understood that he was just a vessel, but he, he's asking God, are you just going to let me die? As Jeremiah sees the potter working this clay, again, the vessel broke. So he, he took that lump of clay and he started working it again. When we mess up, God didn't just say, oh, that one's ruined. Let me go to the next one. He takes that opportunity to start working that clay a little bit more. You know, when we, when we trip up in life, when we hit a trial, or when we hit a stumbling block in life, God doesn't say, well, I figured that one wasn't going to work out. He, no. He says, oh, here's a chance to work on this one a little bit harder. Let me, let me really get and dig down into that, that hard spot in that person's life. You know, it may be a sin in our life that caused that stumble. It may be something from our past that caused us to stumble. But God sees that he... He starts working a little bit harder and a little bit harder. We need to realize, like Job did, that God made us, and he can take this lump of clay and return it back to dust at any time. Amen. We need to realize that God at any minute can say, your number's up, and we're gone. This world's over with for us. We only have one opportunity in this life. I'm with you, brother Charlie. Amen. I got a better dig upstairs. I got things to do. <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, for us Christians, that's an exciting time when God calls us home. But we got one chance at this life. You know, we don't get to hit rewind and say, oh, well, Jesus, I, I, I was going to do things differently. Let me rewind, go back to when I was 30 or when I was 20 or when I was 15 and start all over again. It don't work that way. He gives us one chance, one opportunity to get this life right. And at any time, he can say, your, your, your ticket's up. Your name's up. It's time for you to come and stand before me. We have to realize that without the potter, a lump of clay is nothing. That lump of clay is just going to sit there. You, you take a lump of clay, get it all wet and ready to, ready to form into a vessel. Take it outside and sit on the ground, especially here in Florida. It ain't going to take long for that lump of clay to turn into nothing. Without the potter, the lump of clay is nothing. Without God, we are absolutely nothing. We have no hope in life without God. How many of you have heard the song of the Master's Touch? It's an auctioneer held up a violin to be auctioned. He asked who would, who would bid. The, the bid never got over $2. An old man came from the crowd and took the violin and tuning the strings and played a melody, pure and sweet. The bid started over again and went to $3,000. What was the difference? The master's touch. Here's what happens is the potter applied pressure to this vessel and, and tried to form it into the plan he had in his mind. He, you know, he, he may not have had a drawing over here on the piece of paper, but he had in his mind what he was going to create. Maybe a bowl, maybe a pot, maybe a, uh, a vase. You know, he's got something in his mind that he's going to create. But there, there was that hard spot, that unyielding spot, that spot that would not work like he wanted it to. The potter would not turn from his purpose. He wouldn't, he didn't, he wouldn't give up. He doesn't say, oh, this, this lump of clay is useless. Either the clay will yield or will be broken. Amen. How many times is that in our lives? Mm -hmm. God throws up yield and warning signs in our lives. Don't do that, dummy. Don't, don't go that way. 
Don't participate in that. Don't go down that road. Oh, God, it ain't going to hurt. These are my old buddies. The next thing you know, we wake up and we've had way too many to drink or something. We, may, we wake up and we messed up severely. And instead of just yielding and allowing God to work that hard lump out in our life, we've crumbled. We're down into pieces. And now he's got to gather all, that, all those pieces back together. Sometimes God is trying to form us, but we have those hard spots. Those things that we're not ready to give up yet. Those sins in our life that we're not ready to say, okay, Lord, you know, you, you've been convicting me of this sin. and You've been putting it out there for me. Sometimes we're not ready to just say, okay, I'm going to repent and turn and walk away from that sin. Sometimes God's got to knock us down to rock bottom for us to see the light of day. The second thing is the wheel. Verse 3 says the potter was making something at the wheel. When the potter is making something out of the lump of the clay, they use a wheel. The wheel is this flat disc that they can spin and they can, they can speed it up real fast or they can slow it down real slow as they work tediously at something. How many of you have ever seen those old sewing machines way back in the day before my time? I mean, some of y'all might have been around when they had them. They pedal down there and they pedal that thing. And some of you might even use them. <laughs> you pedal that pedal when you get, you know, you get on a long stretch, you can pedal that thing and get it going and move right along. And then you get to maybe a, a sleeve or a pocket or something. You had to slow it down a little bit to really be careful of what you're doing. The operation is... Sometimes it's delicate, and sometimes it's smooth sailing. That's kind of like the potter's wheel. Sometimes, boy, he can, he can get that thing a going and whoop, 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 get it spinning real fast and, and mold that thing, and then sometimes he's got to slow it down because he's putting real delicate touches into it. Don't quit making fun of it. <laughs> she just asked if it said whoop, whoop. <laughs> The potter works the pedal, and sometimes, again, he speeds it up, and sometimes he slows it down. So then the question would be, what in our life does the wheel represent? What in our life does the wheel represent, maybe in this illustration? I would say the circumstances of life, the, the, the trials, the tribulations we go through. Sometimes that pedal's a, that, that spin, a wheel is spinning fast, you know, we're just... Gliding through life, you know, nothing really major going on. We're living high up on the hog. Everything's going great. And sometimes God's got to slow that wheel down a little bit because we hit a rough spot. And he's got to work on us. Now we're down in that valley. You know, we're going through those trials, those tribulations. He's, he's really putting some pressure on it to try to work a sin out of our life, a bad habit out of our life, something out of our life so that he can get going again, so that he can get to using us again. There's a story of George W. Truett. Uh, he was a, a pastor. And he shot a friend accidentally while hunting one day. He was a pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. Uh, he and the chief of police, James Arnold, was, a bird, was on a bird hunting trip. And as Chief Arnold was climbing through a barbed wire fence, the gun that Mr. Truett was holding accidentally discharged, and the bullet hit Arnold in the calf of the leg. On February 4th, 1898, Arnold died as a result of complications of that gun wound. See, Jake, it's important to take care of the wounds in your leg. Mr. Truett was never the same after that I'm accident. trying to hang out, man. <laughs> Some, someone said he never smiled again. This pastor, they said he never smiled again. But everyone said he, he was a better preacher following the shooting accident. The event, even as tragic as it was, even as, as bad as it was, was part of the potter's sovereignty <clears> of <throat> Mr. Truett. And we see the potter always at work. God took that, that trial, that dark spot in Mr. Truett's life, and he says, you know what? Just like Romans tells us, he can work all things to the glory of God. And that's Romans 8, 28. We see in this story that Mr. Truett went through a life altering situation but even as bad as it was it changed him 
in the good way. He probably didn't see it at the time. Maybe not even while he lived here on earth that, did he see that that tragic event worked to the glory of God. Sometimes we go through those trials and tribulations and we cannot understand why we're going through those things. We can't understand why that loved one is sick. We can't understand why, you know, our, our car just got repossessed or we, why we lost that job or, or why this happened or why that happened. But we got to understand that, that God uses those things to mold us and make us into the people that we are. He's got a bigger picture in life. You know, I, I've said this a couple of times. You know, I, I always look at our life as a, as a movie. God knows how it's going to end. You know, all we can do is trust in him that his path is going to end that movie the right way. You know, so you get some of these movies that give you like option, optional endings. They could have ended this way or that way. You know, we don't really have that opportunity. I mean, we do in a sense that we have the choice to make. Whether we're going to follow God or not follow God. Or whether we're going to follow his plans or not his plans. But in the end, our movie is going to end. And our, we're, one day we're going to stand in front of God. And we're going to have to answer for how that movie played out. And the thing is, God already knows that movie. He already knows because he knows all things. He knows the, the, the decisions we're going to make <coughs> and how they're going to affect our lives. But we have to understand that God's way is perfect. And that sometimes when we go through those trials and tribulations, no matter how bad of a situation it is, no matter how devastating in life it is, that God can take that time and he can use it for his glory and honor if we just give him the opportunity to. Romans 9, 20 through 21 says, But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay? From the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. God has a power over our life. And he's going to form us and make us into the person he wants us to be. A lot of times that just depends on how stubborn we are. And how hard it's going to be to get to that be that person. You know, sometimes we're stubborn. We don't want to yield to those warning signs. We don't want to surrender to his call. So it takes that, honey, I don't want to be like Jonah and go through the, well, the belly of a whale for us to wake up. Sometimes it's losing a loved one before we wake up. The third thing I want to look at is the potter. And we know that God is the potter of our life. And verse 6 there, he says, just as the clay is in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand. Now, yes, he was speaking to Israel. And he says it there, but... You better believe that this applies to us today. Every one of us. God is molding us and making us into the person that he's going to use us to be next week. Next year. Ten years from now. Twenty years from now. He's forming us into the vessels that he can use for his glory and his honor. Isaiah 64, 8 says, But now, O Lord, you are the fa our father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. And all we are the works of your hand. You know, life isn't guaranteed to be a, be a cakewalk once we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But if we surrender to God, it gets easier. Amen. It's easier if we surrender to God than if we fight against <clears throat> God. It's easier if we say, okay, Lord, if that's what you want me to do, even though I don't agree with it, even though I don't think I can do it, even though that's not my plan for my life, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do it with all my ability. Life will be easier than we just stand over here and say, Lord, I don't want to be a preacher. I can't be a preacher. And I'm not going to try to be a preacher. Because he's going to beat you around. He's going to smack you around. He's going to make, put you through trials and tribulations. Until one day you wake up and say, okay, God, I'll be a preacher. And I'm speaking from personal experience. Because <laughs> we are the clay. God is the potter. And we are the work of his hand. Our parents mold us, help mold us and make us. They help push us in directions. They're not always God's directions. But I can tell you those things that our parents push us through, push us into, bring life experiences that God can use in our life. I can think of 
the many different jobs I've held, the many different things that I've done with my dad. Some of them, it's like, some of them I think, what were we thinking there when we did that? But other things, it's like, you know what? You know, I've learned to be able to wire a house by just watching my dad. You know, will that ever, does that mean I'm gonna go get an electrician's job tomorrow? No, because that's not, not even close to anything I ever want to do. But if Miss Susie down the road's got a, you know, a socket that needs replaced, I can go do it for her. And she don't have to call the electrician and pay him 80 bucks for a service charge. Things like that, that are simple things in life that God uses for his glory, for his honor, and his ministry. Verse 4 says, the vessel broke so the potter gathered it back together and started again until it came out like he wanted it. Sometimes God has to break us down to get our attention so he can gather the pieces back together and start again. For me, that was my granddaddy's funeral. When my granddaddy took his last breath, watching my granddaddy die of cancer was when God finally broke me down. Going through eight, nine months of depression, had no care in the world for anything or anybody working my life away, didn't care about anything. But that's when I, I look back on my life and see where God started to, he broke me down. I, he finally got me to where he needed me to be so that he could gather that clay back together and start struggling, <coughs> working it out. Because at that point is when I really see God started changing my life. It was a slow process there for a few years, for a number of years. When God brought my wife into my life, my girls into my life during that time, and it was through that that God was able to start molding me and preparing me for where I am today. Sometimes it may seem that God has given up on us. Sometimes we're, we're down in that valley and we're right at the breaking point. And we think, okay, God, where are you at? I haven't heard from you. I haven't experienced you. I, I don't know what's going on. What am I doing wrong? And he's just waiting for us to surrender. He's waiting for us to just be still so he can gather those pieces together. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are the workmanship created in Jesus Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. We see a picture of long-suffering and grace of God. He did not throw the clay away. He did not give up on Chris Priest. And I thank God he didn't because I'd probably either be in a Red Level Cemetery or a, or a state prison somewhere. He did not say, you, you stubborn clay, I'll, I'll just get another piece of clay. He didn't say, you know what? You don't want to do what I've called you to do. I'll move on to the next guy. No, he kept working and kept molding and kept putting pressure D.L. Moody said, it is amazing what God can do with a broken vessel, providing he has all the pieces. That potter took that, that clay and he made another vessel. God never loses his purpose for each of us. God's gifts and calling are without repentance. You know, as we go through life and as things change in life, as we go through trials and tribulations, we always got to remember that God's got something out there for us to do. He's always preparing us for that next assignment. He's always preparing us for that next job that he wants us to do. And just as that potter is always forming on that clay to prepare it to be what he wants it to be, God is working on us and just preparing us to be willing vessels. Are you being a willing vessel? Are you allowing God to use you? As I spoke this morning about power from the Holy Spirit, we're all as born again believers and well with the power of the Holy Spirit. We all have the opportunity to be used by God. But God's just waiting for us to be willing to allow him to use us. That's going to be stepping out of your comfort zone. That means saying, okay, God, I, I can't do that on my own and in my own power as I spoke this morning. 
that saying, Lord, if that is your plan, if that is your purpose for my life, I surrender it all to you. That you may use me in however you want. But we got to be that willing vessel. That we will allow God to mold us and to make us, to form us into the person that he would have us to be. So that he can use us for his purpose, and for his glory, and for his honor. Let's go to the word of prayer. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for this.